All right there, geezers, Jules here from FGS, home of the Future Game Show. And you know what? I know this may come as a bit of a shocker, but I bloody love video games. <laughs> I mean, how would you have guessed, just based on my career, the channel that I work on, and just my endless rambling about the medium? And it's true, when I'm not thinking about Warhammer in all of its glory, I'm thinking about video games. I know, my girlfriend is very lucky, right? <laughs> lucky to be a priority. <laughs> I kid. She's lovely. She puts up with a lot. And she'd kick my ass. Anyway, where am I going with this? Ah yes, that's right. I do love video games, but my love for video games pales in comparison to the people we're about to talk about today. As they didn't just champion gaming, sometimes they bloody saved it. Thanks to these amazing preservation peeps, titles once thought lost have been brought back from the brink so that we can appreciate them properly or, as is the case here, fit them into a deep cut laden list. Mm, 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 delish. So let's have a chat about them today. As I'm Jules, this is FGS, and these are lost video games that were saved by hardcore fans. And you know the drill by now. This is the deep cut with Jules Gill, a baby. So that means there's going to be games you don't know about, need to know more about, yada, yada, yada. But the real point that I want to talk about today is as follows. I'm going to be using a lot of clips from people who have obviously like painstakingly researched and gone out of their way to find these specific video games. So please follow them, go to their channels, check out their other content. I'm not trying to steal it or claim it in any way, but also just have a think about preserving video games as a whole. Just think about the fact that these people, they are building a library of content that we can go to at any time and look about where gaming was to see where gaming may be going in the future. So just take some time to appreciate these classics for what they truly are. A little bit broken in some cases because they're, they're, they're betas and demos and stuff like that. But still, let's just champion gaming as a whole, shall we? Anyway, let's crack on by talking about Snoopy Flying Ace. 1917. The world is at war. The Germans dominate the skies and launch countless attacks on anyone who dares take to the air. Bloody April is upon us, and at its head is the Red Baron. The Allies, shocked at this overwhelming aerial devastation, call to pilots to step up and end this threat. And it's here where a true hero finally emerges. Ye gods, is that who I think it is? The aerial assassin of Abervale, the dogfighter of Derby, the... The fuck plane guy from the Poundland car park. It's Snoopy! Yeah, it's Snoopy. Yeah, all, all that build up for this, this little joke here. It's Snoopy. And do you know what's madder than the fact that I wasted all of that time just setting up for this? Was the fact that this guy not only had one flying combat game that released in 2010, but this was a sequel to another one. And both of them were bloody brilliant. I know the premise of Snoopy not only being in a literal dog fighting game and it actually being good is kind of mad, but this was indeed the case with the sequel to the original flying arcade game Snoopy vs. the Red Baron. Yet the really strange thing was that this sequel was an Xbox Live arcade title, meaning that when the game was delisted, there was precisely zero trace of it ever having existed. Thankfully though, YouTuber Much Games accidentally stumbled across a copy whilst going to a friend's house who happened to have an old 360 with the game already installed, and being the massive ledge that they are, did a full long play of the game and uploaded it entirely to YouTube. It actually speaks to a wider issue in the gaming industry today, that you could well pay 70 quid for a brand new title only for it to be completely delisted in a couple of years and axed from your library. In fact, this has happened as the time of recording this, because I've had to record a few in advance because I'm going to be off uh, recovering from my hernia surgery. This has just happened with the crew. People logged on to their, their consoles and were like, where's my game? And uh, the developers were like, well, we've closed down the official servers, so no game. You've paid money for actually nothing. And apparently we're okay with that now, it's been normalized. Yeah, weird, right? Yeah, weird, right? Anyways, before I blow a gasket, let's go and talk about something much more chill. Cookies Bustle Mysterious Bombo World. What is this game? Now friends, gather ye round. Kids still say ye, don't they? Yeah. Gather ye round and let me tell you a tale about a cute and charming puzzle point and click game that um, thanks to some weird, obsessive, really aggressive takedown policies nearly didn't exist at all. So say hello and then possibly goodbye to Cookies Bustle, a Japan... What, why have we not cut to footage? What are you still doing here? Oh right, that's why, because 
Apparently, and I don't want to risk this and have this video taken down, apparently using any footage of this game is enough to get the video in question targeted and may be removed from the internet entirely. Seriously, there is some body, some force out there that does not want this game to be shown online and has gone to extreme lengths to have it removed from the internet in totality. I'm sure that you can use some like still images here and there, but... Now I know this sounds extreme, but such is the fury with which someone or something wants to remove Cookie's Bustle from every aspect of the internet. And even more strange than this is that nobody actually seems to know why such an aggressive takedown campaign was launched at this 1999 title, but it was so effective that it was only thanks to a handful of hardcore fans that dumps of this game still exist for you to download and for a few brave people to stream on Twitch and post sporadic clips online. It's a true shame as well because the game actually looks like a ton of silly fun and is filled with absolutely batch moments, such as the opening of the game showing Cookie witnessing two men attack a bus with a rocket launcher before then being gunned down themselves by a roving helicopter. Which is exactly what you'd expect from a video game with this guy as their mascot, right? I mean, yes, terrorist attacks, point and click puzzle games. Oh, they mesh so well. Anyway, let's move on from one hot topic to talk about hot, greasy grappling action as we talk about UWC. So, my friends, you might remember on last week's episode of the Deep Cut with Jules Gill, baby, I spoke at length about wrestling games. Oh, what's that? You don't remember because TikTok and YouTube Shorts has given you a spestos brain. That's, that's okay. Bit worrying, though. Just go back and watch the episode when you get a chance. Anyway, long story short, I love wrestling and I love the strange games that come out of that sweaty hole even more. However, I did have an ace up my sleeve that I was going to use for that list before I realized that it's actually a better fit here. And that is the long lost Nayers wrestling game at UWC. Now, before I go on, I have to give huge props to the YouTube channel Art of Nintendo Power, who not only provides an excellent breakdown of the game, but also went out of their way to purchase the only known copy of this title from an ex-Nintendo employee and then upload all of it for the world to enjoy. Without Stefan's dedication, we would have been robbed of seeing Road Warrior Hawk look like JoJo's new makeup artist, as well as doing way more high kicks to the face than I remember. Now, my memory of him doing high kicks to the face is, uh... Uh, zero, actually, and I can say that with pretty big confidence because of the fact that he was ballooned off his tits on drugs most of the time. His feet were definitely anchored to the floor for like 90% of his career. Still, what the UWC might lack in the overworked simulation department that modern WWE games champion, it definitely makes up for it by being a pretty polished arcade grappler and one that was thought lost for absolutely decades. Now, if that sounded like a good game, you've heard nothing yet, as we're about to talk about Um Jamma Lammy now! Now, I don't know why, but every single time that I think of this title of this game, Um Jamma Lammy now, I just weirdly think of J. Jonah Jameson from Spider-Man just slamming his fist down on the desk and just demanding that they be delivered along with pictures of Spider-Man in the shower. I don't, like, he's not related to this product at all, but I just, in my mind, that's just what happens every single time that somebody says, Um Jamma Lammy now! Oh, welcome to my brain. Anyway, did that feel like a bit of a weird intro? Well, good, because that has set the right tone for the utterly deranged title that is Um Jamalami Now, a pseudo-sequel to the paper-pooched milestone that was Parappa the Rapper. While keeping the same charming aesthetics and rhythm-based gameplay, the genre now has shifted from rap to rock, and it is a glorious transition indeed. Almost as good as this segue into talking about how you're probably thinking to yourself, Jules, you hollow-eyed shrew, I know about Um Jamalami. How is this a deep cut, you... Fool. Well, listen, my friend, Um Jamalami now is actually an arcade port, and trust me, finding them is as rare as finding unobtainium. What also gets me right in the feels is seeing this game being played, weirdly, by, and yes, this footage from Um Eric Yoki isn't lying, Jonathan Bloody Ross. Yeah, it turns out that the British celebrity owns the last working cabinet and after some correspondence, invited Eric to come and play it. Now, aside from the strangeness of this scenario coming together, we also get to see how the game uses a prototype of what would become synonymous with the likes of the Guitar Hero franchise, aka a piece of plastic tat that will live in your attic. But here, the buttons are pressed by you actually strumming them. 
Oh, and it also has a bloody turntable built into it. Yeah, I probably should have led with that. That's the thing that most people would immediately notice about this <laughs> controller. And it turns out that the Gaturn table mode there and the sort of whammy neck that you have there, they represent the shoulder buttons from the original game that have been ported over. And it's pretty cool, actually, because it adds a new layer of sort of interaction. I really like it. The guitar just looks cool. It just looks like a cool game to play. Now, here's the thing. Thanks to MAME, you can actually just go and play Um Jamalami now. Well, right now. But I think that it's worth celebrating the fact that there is still one copy of this arcade game kept in tip-top condition that exists and is preserved by, oddly enough, Jonathan Ross. Right then, my friends, let's really get into things now as we talk about Rayman Garden. Okay, my friends, so here's something that you may not know about me. I absolutely, positively, with every fibre of my being, hate the minions. Oh, I know, what an amazing take. Somebody in their 30s doesn't like something that's aimed primarily at children, but it's not for the reasons that you might think, okay? It's not the fact that they are annoying and stupid and just bloody everywhere. It's actually because they represent, to me, the death of the Rayman franchise. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. That's not even the same thing. The minions are different to the rabbits. Well, you know what? The rabbits came out first, right? And they definitely 100% inspired the minions to exist and the fact that they are everywhere reminds me of that chain of events that led to the downfall of one of the most underloved and underappreciated mascots ever. His games are great and yet he's overshadowed by sacks of flour that look like they've had their sh** kicked out of them and are so endlessly annoying. Ooh, deep breath over here. Therefore, I feel it is my duty to talk about Rayman whenever given the chance and to champion his games. And I get the absolute pleasure of talking about a game that I know absolutely no one has heard of because of the fact it was locked to one singular mobile device. It's time to talk about Rayman Garden. Because yeah, many people will probably be thinking that I'm going to talk about the Snayers Rayman title that never saw the light of day, but instead we're going to talk about the game that was exclusively on the Trium or Trium Eclipse that came pre-installed alongside Rayman Bowling. And it's likely here that my editor is probably having an absolute meltdown, probably trying to think to themselves, Jules, how am I going to get footage of a game that's locked to a mobile that has no way of exporting that footage? Well, fret not, my friend, because there is a YouTuber out there that has done all the work for us. Yeah, that's right, Framerater not only found a Trium Eclipse, but also uploaded a ton of footage of this rather charming puzzle game. Now, the premise of the game is that you're looking for lums that are hidden from sight and must maneuver Rayman around obstacles and take down enemies with your stash of swords. You're given a brief window to view and memorize the level, and then off you go. Also adding to the tension is the fact that Dark Rayman is chasing you relentlessly, meaning that this is a game of positioning, timing, and resource management. Is this the same AI that would go on to inform Mr. X and Nemesis in the RE remake games? No. No. Not at all, really. I, I just thought I'd say that just because in case people were listening to this and not paying attention, just bring them back in with that. Anyway, let's talk now about the Tomb Raider game that never was as we discuss Rika. Now, when Tomb Raider hit the scenes all the way back in 1996, there was a tectonic shift within the industry. And no, it wasn't the uncomfortable shifting of trousers by teenagers as they fell in love with Lara's incredibly pointy sweater hams. This original raider outside of Indy provided gamers with a wonderful fusion of puzzles, platforming, T-Rex shooting, and all the tank controls that they could eat. Therefore, it was quite the surprise when Nintendo, at the time fierce rivals of Sony, didn't actually capitalize on things with a clone of their own. Well, it turns out that they actually did have an answer to Tomb Raider in the form of Rika, who looked to take the adventure to the realms of sci-fi and was set to be published by Nintendo themselves until it suddenly wasn't. Rika quietly slipped off the radar and into obscurity despite positive attention E3 1999, but there was one soul who carried the torch for this title all the way through, a developer by the name of Ten Shu, who worked on the game and was slowly uploading clips of Rika across the years. Now it's unclear if it was Ten Shu themselves or another developer who worked on the title, but recently, as in 25 years after the game was announced, a prototype ROM was uploaded, allowing everyone to experience this Nintendo-branded Tomb Raider. So here's the real question, is Rika Nintendo's answer to Tomb Raider? 
Well, kind of, but kind of not, because outside of a female protagonist, these two games feel very, very different. There's a lot more fluidity going on in Rika. There's a lot more action. I mean, it's set in a science fiction environment as well, so they don't actually feel like the same games at all. And speaking of the worst things I've ever seen, oh God, my eyes, it's time to, oh God, my eyes, talk about, oh God, Superman, the new Superman adventures. Leave me alone! Oh God, okay, so we close on this list by talking about a game that I'm pretty sure that 99.9 .9 recurring percent of people would want to keep lost in the annals of time. Because we're about to talk about the almost port that the PS1 got of Superman 64. Now I know what you're thinking, Superman 64 didn't get a port, did it? Did it? Oh my god, did it? Well, just calm down a second, because thankfully, no, it didn't. Because the devs were quick to realise that porting this garbage was pretty much akin to shoveling shit and dropped it entirely, but not before committing some serious conversion time, or should that be remake time, because it turns out that the N64 version, as abysmal as it is, was somehow too powerful for the PS1, so it needed to be remade from the ground up. Oh yes, what a technical powerhouse this was. Jesus Christ, how, was, how could this absolute garbage not fit on the PS1? Just fit it in the bin instead. Ironically, this process might have actually resulted in a much better game because they would have had to address the, well, all of the stuff that outright just didn't work. However, the tale doesn't end there. As it turns out, this is actually a story of hardcore fans saving the game from oblivion by pasting together assets and rare content drops that have been discovered across the years, but also of one fan who actively destroyed some rare media because of an argument. Now, according to Lost Media Wiki's entry on the game, Richard Evans Mandel showcased to the world a ton of new assets and even a physical disc in 2014, but in a shocking turn of events, snapped the disc in half and removed any traces of the game from his storage after an argument over charging money to upload these extremely rare files. Now, as you can imagine, this set the quest to restore this game back quite a bit. But thanks to some prototypes and more assets that were found, nine working levels were cobbled together. And many thought that this would be the end of the story. But wait, what's that up in the sky? Is it a bird? Is it Sting from WCW? No, it's Mandel. He's back on the scene again. What? Yes, that's right, he popped up in 2020 with a ream of new assets that he'd managed to recover from the previously wiped drive. What a return to form for the once loathed forum user. He even uploaded the files for free, allowing the 2000 build of this game to finally see the light of day. So, was it any good? Fuck no. It was still Superman 64 but on the PS1. But was it an emotional thrill ride? Nah, not really. And that's sometimes all you get. Bye. And there we go, my friends, with that anticlimactic ending. Lost video games that were saved by hardcore fans. I hope that you enjoyed that. And please let me know what you thought about it down in the comment section below. As always, I have been Jules. And I really, really appreciate you like hanging out here, having a chat with us and supporting the channel. And if you want to support me personally, you can go follow me over on the social medias over here. And you can follow my lovely editor over there on their social medias as well. But before I go, I just want to say one thing. We're going to talk about one thing that many people consider lost and hopefully we'll find it today and that is the power of positivity it's deep within us all my friend and sometimes even when the world is feeling very oppressive and things are getting us down just remember there is a light that we all have inside of us and that is the light of kindness just be kind to yourself you deserve that you deserve love you deserve happiness you deserve success and nothing no one else nothing in this world can tell you otherwise right you're a massive ledge now go out there and absolutely smash it today I believe in you. As always, I've been Jules. I just punched my keyboard and I will speak to you soon. Bye, everyone.